because like I say, it'll get, get me out of the way, won't it? That's good. Um, <coughs> so, um, I, what I've done is I've put a, a mix together. It's, it's sort of Halloween coming on, so I thought maybe nothing too light. But uh, The day I said goodbye to dance, slightly autobiographical. One day, Crow came to my window. Without warning, he spread his wings, black and menacing. He squawked a discord of four screeching apes, slaked my ears with noise of vicious crow talk, flew at me, clawing my face, bloodied my nostrils, my lips, scratched runes into my cheeks. He stuck his beak down my throat, stopped my tongue, and in the blank silence, shat on my eyes. That day, I said goodbye to dance. I cried, emptied myself, feeling sullied, darkened. I wept for lost rhythms, unpicked lemons, overripe grapes bleeding from the vine. Lost lovers milk their way out of my breast. Users spewed up in verges, scurried away. Gossips and mischief makers poured out of every orifice in streams of snot and urine. And when the wind, fresh with mountain menthol, filled my lungs, I turned myself inside out like you would a rubber mould and swilled every bend, every internal hiding place. And I waited. I waited for the beat to return. Waited for dance to flesh me out again. The first film I ever went to see when I was a child was The Wizard of Oz. And apparently I was so young, I screamed so loudly that the demon that took me out of the cinema. <laughs> but it's, it's always had a strange effect on me. Um, a guy called Yip Harburg wrote the lyrics, Red Shoes. Three wishes, Dot, said Yip, or you'll stay in this hell forever. And no going against me, or raising the dead from the east, or filling your head with stories about witches and wizards. You got yourself into this mess. You have followed the goddamn road. Don't expect pots of gold. Now make that wish, the camera's rolling. What's it going to be? Speak up, Dot. You've already got the shoes. How about an emerald ring? What? What's that? You want to take your mates? Look, take your dog and take the rainbow. The rest belongs to me. Click your goddamn heels. Go home. We both know there's no place like it. I can't fix the dream, can I? I'm just the guy that writes the songs. <laughs> Being a poet, I, I think, well, personally, I live in this sort of in-between land sometimes, you know. And David often says to me, where are you? Where are you now? <laughs> where are you now? And so I thought I'd read this one. You know, we've got haiku and sonnets and villanelles and, and what have you. But this is a poet's rant. Being a poet means filching a clause, listening into conversations, because people out there don't know what they're saying. Sometimes they're chatting, sometimes they're praying. Sometimes they're pausing, pretending they're hip. Sometimes they're cursing and don't give a shit. Sometimes they're bardic and don't even know it. That's tea at the Ritz for any would-be poet. Being a poet means living in a space in an outside body north of your face. And only those near enough to embrace get to feel the crust, the true carapace, the exoskeletal imagination that hovers full throttle, intoxication like you drink a bottle of aeration that's put your nose flat on a triangle cheek and stitch your lips up till you look like a freak. And you live inside this pre-vomit fizz, this fuzz, this buzz, this woozy whiz, this quiz, this zigzag of quixotic raving, till it gushes out in a globular spill, a gritty spit and bits of opinion, undecipherable as a kid on a pillion doing a ton on a road heading south, vulgar expletives spilling from his mouth. 
You live inside this vibration, this quiver, this fog of jumblies, this misty river that shimmers and shines like a strictly come dress or a curtain of mirrors round a naked princess. And you learn to be word catchers on the wing, swallowing rhymes and rhythms that swing. You skip and you hop and you march like an ant. And when you take breath, what you've got is a rant. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. 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 And um, speaking of ants, heroism of the doomed. I read the Barsley Chronicles. You may have heard this one, Cora. I don't know. I read the Barsley Chronicles and I sometimes get inspiration from the headline. And the headline said, Wildlife experts plead with people not to harm ants as they come out into the open to mate. <laughs> um, it, it went on to say, 300 landed on a doorstep in Barnsley. And I thought, how, how the hell do they know 300? You know, it's anyway, 300 got me thinking about the mopoli and sex and, and, you know, Leonidas, and this came from it. Heroism of the doomed. They knew we were coming out of the walls, out of the cracks, the crevices, with balls bulging in unnatural flight, our legs dangling like airborne paras dropping on Arnhem. Only this wasn't Arnhem, this wasn't war, this was blind necessity. As the temperature rose, we felt our wings, then the final penetration of doom. A doom that justified our sacrifice. After that, the females were on their own. They landed on pavements, on patios, on park benches, on playground slides and swings, only to be slaughtered by the thousand in merciless extermination. Some were boiled alive, some were poisoned, others squashed under stampeding feet. Three hundred swarmed the steps of a house in Barnsley, stood their ground, perished no match for their mighty sexies. Or for Mrs Cox, for that matter, who took a wet mop and swilled the lot down the drain. Thermopylae reenacted, leaving the mop to lie, saturated in doom dance. <laughs> I travel quite a lot uh, up and down the country on the Megabus. I don't know whether you use the Megabus, but it's quite um, efficient. And... Um, Quite a pleasant experience, unless you hit a half-term holiday. The Megabus. <coughs> I'm tight-packed, tarmac-tracked, half-hacked, double-stacked, boot-racked, baby-clacked, over-sacked, travelling back, bus-whacked. Four kids in the back, quarrelling dundies, squirrel-like gulls, spat, cause bedlam. It's a brat attack. Mother ignores them, father doesn't bat, cool as a pint from the working men's tap. His face a perfect Picasso abstract. A bearded guy in Che Guevara cap stands up in the aisle, takes rucksack from rack and lets out a fart. It's a gas attack. In the seat across a girl with a mat, a ring through her nose, tattoos on her back and hair in a bunch of blue bladder rack, appears to have an anxiety attack, forgets her headphones, Plays Fleetwood Mac, the Albatross Riff, and I'm travelling back to France and the French and Neat Armagnac and give it me hard on a Ray Balzac. Give it me hard, Balzac, twat. Fuck, where's the Prozac? Where's the smack? Where's the crack? It's a heart attack. The Fleetwood Mac smells I can't hack. Feet in my back and kids are need locking up in a disused cooling tower at Drax. I'm tight packed, tarmac tracked, half packed, double stacked, bus racked, boot bin, baby clacked, oversacked, travelling back, bus whacked. It must be coming up to the quarter of an hour almost, is it? I don't know how we're doing. Yeah, we've got one or two. Um, I was going to read you Ted the Bear's Picnic, but I think I'll go straight into I Fell in Love with a Zombie. Really? It's, it's my love poem. Um, you know, all poets write love poems, don't they, from time to time. And this one's mine. <clears throat> I Fell in Love with a Zombie. You might think, how could a quiet girl like me 
fall in love with a deadbeat zombie. But it was easy, the pale David Bowie face, the smoky opal eyes, lost stargazing look, the lurch black suit with formaldehyde musk, coal heaver shoulders, odour brute armpit, and the bass noise he made drove me crazy. <laughs> Low and sexy. Everyone wanted the strong silent type in those days. Gaunt, unbrushed hair, sallow complexion, salivation that made snogging sensational. That irresistible Justine de Villeneuve hadn't eaten for a week pout that put them beyond imagination. And their grave determination to be zombies made women crazy. <laughs> so damn sexy. He used to keep jelly babies under the bed. Said they soothed him through the long sleepless nights, slurping, sucking, sliding his tongue around soft, squidgy baby brains, seemed to calm his nerve, helped him relax, stopped him biting my head off. He was quite a gentle zombie in bed, breathed heavy like a creaking ship, crazy. <laughs> Slow and sexy. Okay, he could be a creep, a weirdo, a complete no-brainer. He was a zombie. If the loony moon was up, the moon that hit lit his feet, he'd just have to beat it, scoop out a few skulls, do his own thing. One night the police caught him, red-handed, jumped him in the street, got tetchy when he made that crazy noise. All moon glow and sexy. And before he knew it, he had one arm up his back, his cheek pressed flat against a brick wall. Stop, I called, he's a feckin' zombie! But it was too late. He came on all Hulk Hogan, landed a forearm smash, ripped the policeman's head off, sat on the pavement sucking brains, blood, fresh flesh. Man, it was kitsch, those crazy sirens and his crazy noise. <laughs> so bloody sexy. It was a senseless act, landed him behind bars. They couldn't give him life, so they starved him. Now he's all puckered up like a squashed plastic bottle. Yes, he was a deadbeat, a deadbeat zombie, but, but I loved him. I don't sleep much these days, gaze at the stars, wander around the house sucking jelly babies. Drive men crazy with the bass noise I make. Low and sexy. That's me. <laughs> <laughs>